Number six, you see the screen? Mm -hmm. In the main event, you have 15 big blind and our ITM. When I got that, I'm going, what? Yeah. I Googled now. Oh, in the money. And I actually, so I went ahead and put that. What is a good strategy to implement if payouts are flat? Would you blind down to five big blinds to just hit the higher money jumps? Or are you playing more aggressively for the win? Think of the World Series main event. And what is the best strategy for going deep in a tournament once you're already in the money? Yeah, that, 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 is, that is an excellent question. And, uh, and I think that type of question falls under what I would call um, typical misconceptions about, about tournaments. Like one of the, let me start with uh, misquoting <laughs> Stu Unger because uh, Stu Unger said something amazing basically when it comes to tournament. He said something along the lines of, I'm either the first one out or the last one out. So what, what basically that means is that, you know, we, you know, we, we, we go for, 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 for the trophy. And I think this is an excellent, excellent approach to tournaments because all the money is at the very top. Actually, people should be willing to take more risks uh, at these stages of the tournament where everybody's more conservative as the other way around, in particular near the bubble, which is like, this is where people get the most, like they, they're really close to the money and they're thinking, oh my God, I mean, I really want to cash out, especially the main event. And I, trust me, I totally, I totally understand that. But for people who are not necessarily recreational players or for people who want to just flat out win and then maximize their, the profitability, my suggestion is risk, risk, risk. Of course, calculated risk, but do not avoid it embrace it and it comes back to the first question that you know like there's certain elements of variance that we cannot control so we might as well go for the optimal uh, strategy whatever that may be without um, sacrificing some of our uh, profitable aggression we do not want to sacrifice profitable aggression because that may help us get a couple of pay jumps here and there but it will rob us from the opportunity to hit the, uh, the, the bigger prizes. So in the long run, we're going to make less money. That's, that's, the, that's what I mean by we do not want to sacrifice our profitable aggression. Can you give examples of a calculated risk? Yeah, an example of calculated risk uh, would be uh, situations where, now especially like if we're talking about like 15 big blinds, would be situations where let's say it falls to us on the button uh, and uh, we're holding a hand like let's say uh, Jack 10 of hearts. Uh, this is, you know, by all standards, that should be a shawl, right? I mean, you know, like most, now there are, when I say by all standards, there's always exceptions to, to everything, but like this is a strategy, well, shoving there is, is not a mistake, let's put it that way, and, and most likely is the kind of the only, almost only move we have, because if we raise, we may get shoved on, and then what do we have to, I mean, we probably have to, it, 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 it's complicated at that point, so that, again, so let's say that it folds around to us, we're on the button with 15 big blinds, we have Jack 10 suited, that would be a calculated risk. We go all in there because we understand that is a profitable move against in many situations. Sure, somebody can wake up with a hand, sure, somebody can wake up with a monster hand and they call us and we can get out of the tournament. But this is not a time to think what is the, but the worst thing that can happen. Uh, it is not a time to think what is the best thing that can happen. It is a time to think what is the best strategy in that position in the, in the long run. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Like not be optimistic, not be pessimistic, be, be realistic. And Jack 10 suited is the type of hand which is correct to uh, go broke with at, at that stage of the tournament. For, for those who are new, why, no. is, why is Jack 10 suited a shove there for people that are new? Oh. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is actually an excellent question. So there's been some uh, some analysis. Uh, people they've tried to. Um, okay. Let, let me let me just go a step back. Uh, a, a, a friend of mine, unfortunately, he 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 passed out recently. His name is Paul McGrill, a great backgammon player and a great poker player. He actually came up with the idea of uh, an M, and that's what ha uh, Harrington, uh, Dan yeah, Harrington, yeah, talks quack, about. Yeah. Quack. Quack. 
Quack Quack, yes, you're, you're familiar with Paul. Yes, I, 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 I love this dude. May he, may if, he rest in peace. If for anybody who doesn't understand that, he, he would always, if he was having a pair of deuces, he called them ducks. And then mm -hmm. he would say Quack Quack and call with them. So go ahead. <laughs> I'm, I'm amazing, amazing gentleman. So, um, yeah, so uh, Paul came up with this brilliant idea that in tournaments, um, the way to measure the size of our stack depends on the cost um, we would have to pay in blinds and antes per round. And he, for instance, let's say that if every round costs us, let's say, 1,000 chips, you know, like uh, the small blind is 250, the big blind is 500 and you know like we pay whatever like five we we'll say 500 to keep it simple 50 50 50 50 50 and it adds up to a thousand then a thousand is one unit of m he would think of that as a one unit of m so for instance somebody who would have twenty thousand in chips he has enough money to survive for 20 rounds or he has 20 units of m or his m is 20 if we want to be a little bit more abstract so that was a measure of how healthy our stack is. And people did some analysis using computers when our M gets really, really low. And we, mind you, when we have only 15 big blinds, our M is probably around seven. So we have like, if we count like the small blind and all the antis, that's probably another blind. So we, we can survive about seven rounds, which is not a lot. So we are in a situation which we very, very, very shortly, we're gonna be out of chips. So there is something bad coming and that is we're gonna eventually lose our chips. So we have to take advantage of some opportunities. That's what calculated risk means. But um, the, uh, the analysis that was done by the computers was what kind of hands, hands, excuse me, we should be shipping with, we should be shoving with, we should be going all in with from different positions uh, under different circumstances. And, and certainly when the M is that low, um, those computer analyses uh, suggest that from that position, going all in is the correct way. Yeah, and, and I think that if you look at Jack-10 suited, no matter what your opponent has, you can effectively make the nuts. You can effectively. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you are, you know, you, you could make the nut flush and you, you know, you could make it and you could make a nut straight depending yeah. on the cards that are coming. Mm -hmm. So um, Daniel said, yeah, McGrill known as X-22 was actually the one yes. who said quack, quack, not Harrington. Paul calculated all the probabilities by right. hand before computers. Oh, yeah. Brilliant, man. Absolutely, absolutely Correct. brilliant, brilliant. Correct. Dan Harrington actually, and this is good that you mentioned that, Dan Harrington actually mentioned M in his book and he did credit Paul McGrill. So the, uh, it, it, Daniel is spot on on this, right? It, uh, Paul is, is behind all this 100% and Dan Harrington, a great gentleman also, uh, he was, uh, he, he, he credited him. I, I believe, I mean, Paul told me, I don't, I don't remember the exact details, but I believe um, Dan may have uh, called it M in his honor. I don't. I, I, I'm not sure who coined the term M. I, that I'm not sure about. I would. I would have to. I would. I have to ask somebody like Dan. Or something like this, but, I, I thought but, it was yeah. McGrill, but it doesn't. It. it I thought. It, I don't know. I always wondered. Now I have to be frank with you, because I always. I always wish they'd use something else. You know how you're saying that they have shorthand, scientists have shorthand. I never understood why they used M for it. I mean, that I'm going, what is M? And it took me a long time. And I actually would, I kept every single tournament that I play, people may think I'm a crazy woman, but I have the, the printout of the levels. And at each break, mm -hmm. I write down how many chips I have and I calculate my blinds and I calculate my M's going into that level. And it gives me a, mm -hmm. it gives me a good feel for where I am. So, That's great. so let's go to, okay, this next one, 
we're going to do, I'm going to go through these two questions are extensive, but let's, I'm going to read through both of them and then sure. let you have at it. Number seven, I want to get advice on knowing when to open up my hand range based on how many big blinds or M rounds in order to not get blinded out. So, you know, she read her mind. So this is a perfect place to have this by mid stage of a tournament and blinds increased, especially with the, the new big blind ante. I am being forced to go all in or race with hands. I would not normally play. Otherwise I get blinded out suggestions for not getting short stacked later in the tournament and thereby com being compelled to play marginal hands. Let's look at the other question and then I'll let you deal with both of them. Mm -hmm. I'd, number eight, I don't know how to do the math or GTO game theory optimal. <laughs> I, I, had, I wrote it down. <laughs> I, I said those are the initials. To know when to start opening up my game or what cards to open up with. At this point, I am making my best guess based on position, number of chips versus blinds, pot odds, number of players in hand, which players are in hand, such as big stacks or type players who raise before me and just plain old gut feeling. I have made final tables in April seven times and two of them I bubbled or made men cash and was eliminated. Three tables, I finished seventh, eighth, and ninth. Also, men cash due to my chip stacks getting killed by the blinds. I was able to win one tournament and finish third in another. I want to open up my game sooner to, to get chopped so I can go farther and make it to the top where the money is. Is there a math formula for this? Help me. So here, looking for suggestions on not blinding out or going broke in the bubble, but specifically ask if there is a formula or rule of thumb that covers this, basically how to calculate fold equity. Now I understand that that was mm -hmm. really long. <laughs> so uh, no, that's okay. Uh, go. <laughs> I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, uh, first of all, in no particular order, I really like the, the, the saying here, if it ends broke, don't fix it. Uh, that I think applies to, to the second question, but we'll, we'll, we'll get to that, to the, get to that in a second. Now, uh, let's try to make a connection to the things that we're ready. Yeah, I just want you to take right? your. I, I want you to take your time with this and just enjoy it. You don't have to rush through it. Absolutely, I I, I love it. I love it. It makes me it makes me happy. I can talk about poker all the time. Sometimes I joke to my students that I think that I love understanding, dis dissecting the game, talking about the game, thinking about the game more than I like playing it. Sometimes it's it's the, you know the mathematician in me. I, I love I love those things, um, but I love playing too. So. Um, yes, so the, the first question about short stacking. Now, there is there's certain elements which I definitely want to cover. Number one is there is inevitability. And what do I mean by inevitability? Uh, tournaments that have bad structure, inevitably, they want to lead to situations like this. So number one would be, let's plan ahead. Again, similar to what we were saying before, we don't want to want to table change if we can against the pro, something similar like that. Try to play tournaments that have good structures. Like that, this is very important. We're looking for tournaments that, um, you know, the, the, the blind structure is going to be long enough so we have enough time for us to make decisions, chip up, and, uh, and build a stock so when the later stage of the tournament come, we have a, a healthier stock. Number two would be the idea of Stu Anger. You know, either be the first person out or the last person out. We have to take risks earlier on at the tournament. And actually, it may be worth it from an um, endurance standpoint uh, to uh, even getting into those like coin flips, coin flip situations, right? Uh, they often say that in order to win tournaments, you have to win coin flips, meaning, you know, ace king versus queens or queens versus ace king or something like that. If an opportunity like that pre present itself, I think it's actually correct to take the risk and go for it. Like you have like, let's say a very big draw, you know, and, and your opponent is ready to put you all in. It's probably worth it to quote unquote gamble there. So you either double up early and you have a very healthy stack that can take you all the way to the final table potentially, or get knocked out and then save all those extra hours, go, you know, get some coffee, go some, get some tea, spend it with your friends. So they, in terms of durability can actually help. So some of these issues can be resolved by thinking at a grand scheme of things, by thinking ahead of time. So 
uh, uh, tournament selection and also um, be prepared to quote unquote gamble because certain elements we cannot avoid them. There's certain certain amount of, of inevitability. That would be my probably my summary for the first question. Uh, now, in terms of the second question, uh, the, the, the second question, there's so much to unpack as well. <laughs> I um, know, I know. <laughs> it, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful question. First of all, um, I, I don't know if it's the fact that I have actually, um, I happen to be uh, experience exactly in not just uh, how GTO applies to poker. I've actually taught, <laughs> coincidentally, I've taught classes of game theory. So I'm actually very familiar with the topic. And the more familiar I am with the topic, the more I feel that it should be away <laughs> from poker. And I should probably explain what that means because I'm sure, you know, like any, any mathematicians who, who would see this, they would say, Duncan, are you, are you crazy? What are you talking about? First of all, Let's clarify what GTO is and what GTO is, is not. And by GTO, game theory, optimal. Like people hear the word optimal and they think optimal, that means I win the most. That is actually not true. Uh, game theory optimal, optimal does not stand for maximum profitability. It stands for unexploitableness, meaning that no matter what our opponent does, we have secured a potentially very low profit, but that low profit, it's absolutely secure. Nobody's gonna take it from us. Let me give you an example in simpler terms. Let's say that we play rock, paper, scissors, right? The, the good old rock, paper, scissors that everybody loves, right? I mean, rock, paper, scissors. So the quote unquote game theory optimal strategy, the best way to play that game to not lose in the long run would be to randomize your strategy. So you roll a dice, if it's one or two, you start with rock. If you roll a three or four, you go with, uh, with paper. And if it's five or six, you go with scissors. So that's completely random. Nobody can ever exploit you because you don't even know what you're gonna choose until you roll the dice. But would you play that strategy if you, if you went to Vegas for the World Series of Rock, Paper, Scissors? I mean, that's a great strategy to not lose, but that's not a strategy to win, right? That's like, if, if your opponent is always starting, let's say with rock, right? Or they play a lot of rocks, you want to exploit them by going paper. And of course, you know, like any mathematician will tell you, but Duncan, if I always go with paper, can they just read into this and then start going with scissors? And that's exactly the point of optimal. The point of optimal is that you do something that if your opponent, no matter what your opponent does, no matter who you're playing against, you're, you're um, securing that minimal profit. And I should underline that, that minimal profit. So it would be like, you know, uh, picking up quarters in front of a steamroller sometimes because that would be like, um, to, to, to give you an example of that, there's an amazing example of that in, uh, in Matt uh, Janda's book, Applications of No Limit Hold'em, and uh, two great poker players of, of our generation, uh, Mason Malmoth and David Sklansky, uh, great authors too. They're talking about that in the foreword. So, to make a long story short, because I don't want to make it too complicated, Matthew Janda suggests an optimal defense to, for instance, prevent against bluff, bluffs, uh, check raise bluffs on the river. So to give you, to keep it very simple, because I don't want to go into, into complicated uh, details, let's say we're Alice and we bet, uh, that's my main heroine in the book, that's why I keep calling, I keep mentioning Alice. Alice is my favorite, it's my archetypical <laughs> winning poker player. Uh, and, and Bob, which is my archetypical recreational poker player. So Alice, she's up against Bob on the river, she makes a big bet, and now Bob raises her big, right? So now let's say that Alice has one pair. I'm not even gonna go into details what the board texture is, I wanna keep it simple. Now, anybody who has played poker against most recreational players who raise big on the river, you know, unless, you know, like draws missed, and again, I don't wanna go into details, we know that more often than not, Bob has what? A good hand or a bad hand when they make a big check raise on the river? Usually they have a good hand. So if Alice tries to say, okay, I really wanna protect myself against Bob potentially bluffing me, she's gonna be giving Bob a lot of money in the process because Bob is really not bluffing her. So if, if Alice 
if Alice decides to always give Bob credit, even though that sounds scary to some people, but Duncan, if, if Alice gives Bob credit all the time, doesn't that make her open to exploitation? Doesn't that mean that Bob is going to take advantage of her? Yes, but only if Bob realizes that. And the truth of the matter is that most recreational players do not realize that. I mean, you go and you play at your local uh, low stakes and most players do not bluff nearly as much as we think. So assuming that almost every check raise on the river is a value bet instead of a bluff is actually a very safe bet in the long run. And it's equivalent of Bob always goes with the rock on the river, right? So Alice all has to do is just go with paper, which is fold, just, just, just fold, just don't, don't, don't go with it. And, and, and for, for that reason, I feel that uh, game theory optimal uh, has some issues. So what was Mason's and, and Sklansky, uh, Mason's and David's comment on Matthew Janda's book? It says, some of the advice in this book for optimal play may not be the most profitable at your local game. And that was actually their advice. They say there are some bluff catching frequencies that Matthew is suggesting in the book, but be wary because people bluff way less than they should by what is considered to be optimal. So optimal does not mean profitable. Optimal means unexploitable. So sometimes it's okay to do something that leaves us open to exploitation, provided that we know that our opponent is not gonna read into this because it's, it's too complicated for them to read into this. So for that reason, I would, I would you know, vote against, against game theory optimal, even though like I sound like a hypocrite, I'm, I'm teaching game theory optimal at school and for, for games in general, and I'm suggesting not using it at the poker table. So I was only half joking when I said, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I, I really, I really am a strong advocate against uh, game theory optimal because it's way too complicated and it only secures a minimal um, a, a profitability, uh, we, we, it, it's, I look at it this way, uh, game theory optimal secures that we don't lose, but it doesn't maximize our winnings. So that's, uh, that's well, like, favorite. like anything, you have to know the tendency of the players you're with. And that's the reason why I keep talking about updating your profile. And that was one of the things that my husband taught me originally is that you have to continually profile, continually, continually profile update the profile the profile you've done on the player it changes continually and he actually coined a phrase called poker feng shui because he's not he's not a woo-woo guy but he he heard me talking about feng shui about moving energy things around and it was it was terrific because the energy changes at the poker table based on where the chips go how people win who comes and goes and when people come to the table you have to when they and somebody else comes with big stacks you have to then sit back and almost almost think back to what happened when you started the tournament you have to reprofile everybody because when somebody comes in it it changes and and what i want you to do is since you mentioned alice as being a heroine in your book can you give us an idea of the premise of your upcoming poker book and i know we don't have a title yet it's still in draft mode so we won't even i don't even want you to suggest the title you suggested the other day because you're not going to go with that <laughs> so what's <laughs> what's true. the what's the premise of your upcoming poker book right so so, so what, what i'm trying to do is i am um, i'm trying to explain as colloquially as possible why money flows from prof from amateurs to professionals at the poker table and uh, and uh, the, that's basically that's basically the idea so i'm trying to explain what is it that professionals in a vacuum they do better than amateurs and uh, but not things like oh you know under the gun when there's the two limpers they raise to this amount you know with that with that hand there is there is there's the, there is that as well uh, but I, i'm trying to uh, abstractify and I'm trying to if that's even a, if there's even a verb I'm trying to extract the components 
that professionals are doing better. Uh, and to, to give you an idea, some of the things, I mean, I'm talking about things like money saved is money earned. I'm talking about the idea that professionals find a way to optimize. Like for instance, um, if they can get the same effect by betting $100 instead of $120, they're going to bet $100 because then they can save the extra $20. Or if they can find a good fold on the river uh, because they know they're behind, they're going to find that fold. So things like this uh, that, that, that make uh, a lot of, I say a lot of difference. Or for instance, I'm talking a lot about how poker in a vacuum is an honest game. That's a little bit controversial. But the idea is that people bluff way less than they should. And it's, it comes back to the argument that we, uh, we was trying to uh, make uh, earlier that um, at the poker table, although people do bluff, the actuality is that more, more uh, wagers are generally good hands versus bad hands. So people bluff way less than, than, than most people th think. And uh, the computers actually proved that to us. When, when the computer was playing what we call optimal strategy, he was bluffing with crazy frequencies, with things that made zero sense to any human. So we, but we're not playing against computers, thank God. We're playing against other humans. So yeah, so the idea is I'm trying to explain why money flows from amateurs uh, to professionals. And I use two archetypes. I use Alice as, as my professional poker player and Bob as the recreational poker player who, who wants to, to have fun. And, uh, and I'm trying to explain, you know, the merits in, in, in both situations and also why it is important also for professional poker players to respect the other side of the, of the coin because there's a lot of people who want to have fun at this game and it's a great game and we need to respect those people who want to want to have fun and they may be incredibly successful in other areas of, of life and they just want to, you know, gamble. And they're not dummies. They know that they're going to lose their money to, to, the, to the professionals, but they, they want to have fun in the process. So I'm trying to look at both, um, uh, 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 at both worlds. What led you to write a series of articles on tournament deal, deal making? Oh, that, that, that's a great question. Yeah. So like, there's so many thoughts in my head sometimes that I, I, I want to actually, I want to actually write them down. Uh, <laughs> part of the reason, yeah, uh, that's, 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 a, that's a great question. Well, that, that's I'll, right. I'll tell you, actually, we'll have a recording of it. So you <laughs> just, just that, let that, it flow. That, that, that's true. <laughs> That's right. Yes. And, and you know, so, somehow, you know, like it's the, you know, the, the, the scientist in me always feels that, you know, everything that I say is incomplete, right? I mean, knowledge is always incomplete. So I, I always feel that uh, there is something missing, you know, and I'm always trying my best to, 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 to improve it. Um, so, I, but, wait a minute, I have see, to interrupt you. I've got to interrupt you and say this is that you and I share that perfection witch on our shoulder. I mentioned it in our tech check and you laughed at that because you and I are really like-minded when it comes to that because sometimes That's you just true. have to let it come out. So just just let it flow. I mean, I read the, the, the three articles on, on tournament deal making and it was really helpful to me because it's been so long since I've, since I've been at the table because of family care. Mama's gonna be 93 next in a couple of weeks. So, um, so go ahead. I, I interrupted you. So what, what led you to write a you know, series of articles on tournament deal making? Right. Like you said, it's, it's a conversation, no monologues. I love the interruption. So it's very important. I like it. <laughs> so, uh, so honestly, like what happened was um, my, my, my girlfriend, she was, uh, she was playing a tournament and she was at the, uh, she was at the final table and um, what happened was uh, she was playing really well. She was the chief leader and she asked me for advice and she said, what do you think I should do? And I said, um, what, what, what is the best financial decision? So she, it was clear because I said, what, what do you want to do? Uh, first of all, I asked her, I mean, do you want to, are you having fun? Do you want to play or do you want to make the best financial decision? I said, I want to make the best financial decision. I, I enjoyed the tournament. So it all comes down to money at this point. And I said, okay. So my recommendation would be, you know, to um, have this, this negotiation. And then I, 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 I started thinking what would be the best, the best way to, um, uh, to, uh, to negotiate those things. Because also I, I, have, I have to say that I'm primarily a cash game player. I play a lot of cash games. I mean, I, I haven't played tournaments in, in, in a long time, but these were some of the things that actually helped her go through um, her, her situation, her situation at the poker table. And she made those suggestions. Um, uh, funny enough, 
her opponent rejected. And funny enough, she won first place. So that <laughs> sometimes, sometimes that happens too. So, but she was very thorough and very polite and very nice about it. But it turns out that the, you know, the players that were playing against, they, they were like, you know what? I mean, you know, I, I actually one player said I make such and such money per month, and uh, you know that money is important to me, so I kind of want to win it. And uh, and Asami, uh, my girlfriend, she said, okay, no problem. Let's let's just play. So, so I thought to myself it would be a good, a good idea to actually summarize all of these calculations and also explain um, ins and outs of, of the, the complex method, the ICM calculation, because many people don't understand what goes in. And I just wanted to see, if, you know, try to explain it in as simple language as possible, including all the calculations. Well, that was, that was tough. And then, I, start, I wanted to do one article and then I did three because there were so many things in my head. Oh, I, I, I love it. I, it. They were really very helpful to me. So thank you very much for that. And, and how, is, how is an academic like yourself so interested in poker? I, I think it's because I'm, uh, I'm interested in games in general. Like I started playing chess when I was five years old. I, I played a lot of backgammon. In, yes, I played a lot of backgammon in uh, uh, during my college years uh, I still play games like a lot of games mostly card games uh, I play a ton of games and uh, I'm always interested um, it's funny because as a graduate student <laughs> I remember uh, uh, telling my supervisor at the time I said you know what like math seems like a game to me you know like math is very, very much like a game you know we have a puzzle and we try to figure it out and he was he was almost a little bit offended he's like math is not a game it's like yeah, yeah i understand what you're saying i understand it's very important i mean I'm, i and i know i'm using it i'm still doing research to this day so i'm i'm using math for some from very serious things and um and, and it turns out uh, poker too, which is also to me, is a very serious thing as well. You know, uh, it's not just just a game. For some people, it's their livelihood. Uh, and uh, uh, so, I, I I found that connection. I, I'm thinking of math as a game, and I'm thinking of games as math. And by math, I mean patterns. I think like specific things that when I understand them, I want to just break them down and understand. Like I was, I was incredibly interested, for instance, when somebody told me that there is a, a rock, paper, scissors tournament in Las Vegas where the first prize is $50,000. I was very interested in knowing what the winning strategies are. Like I'm incredibly interested in things like this. I, I, I did some research. I found some interesting, interesting things. <laughs> I don't know if anybody cares, but I did find some weird things about that stuff. Yeah. That sounds like a, an, an, a, a, talking about the rock, paper, scissors tournament. I think that's an entirely different recording. Is that, I think that would be great interview. Correct. <laughs> Correct. So, Correct. What makes Correct. a poker player great? Yeah, no, that, that is, that is also, that's also a, a, a great question. Um, I think, the number one thing that uh, I, I, would, I would put on the list will probably be consistency. I think what really makes a really good poker player great is consistency. And consistency goes in different levels. Like uh, consistency means consistency with the bankroll management, consistency across their strategy, consistency with uh, putting the hours at the poker table. Because um, in, in order to, and I'm, and I'm talking of course, a professional poker player because I mean, um, uh, I don't want to just talk about strategy uh, in, in, in general when I'm thinking of a poker player because there's so many, so many different levels. But I would say greatness in poker, even if we look at every level separately, I would think that consistency will be, will be number one. So an issue, for, uh, let me explain what, any, what a lack of consistency, what kind of problems can bring at the poker table. Bankroll management would be a perfect example. Somebody who's playing, uh, you know, uh, beyond their, their means at some point, you know, they, they, they play at regular games and all of a sudden they take a shot at a game which is way higher than the, what they can afford. They can go broke in just, just one session. Somebody who's really good, but then when they get tilted, you know, their game deteriorates. That's, a, again, lack of consistency. Somebody who, another lack of consistency would be somebody when it comes to hours, 
somebody who plays, you know, 40 hours a week. But then the next week they run really good in, let's say, a cash game. And then within the first three hours, they make as money as they usually make in three weeks. So like, and they say, okay, that, that's a great time for me to take a break. Like that is, that will be somebody who does not understand variance in poker, who does not understand that the same whether there's good days, they're going to be bad days. So good days don't mean anything, you know, like a, a poker player should actually, you know, pay themselves a fixed amount regardless of how well or, or bad they're doing. And then anything extra can help them move up uh, or down the stakes instead of just going buying cars and things like that. Yeah. I think consistency is absolutely the key, but can we put another word with that? Because I think it is consistently mindful. Because mm -hmm. I think mindfulness is the absolute core of playing proper poker. It's not a case of, you know, it, it doesn't, it's not being results oriented. It's just doing the right thing at the right time consistently, but it's mindfulness because that to me was entirely the core of poker and how it saved my life and took me to the place of calm. I, I couldn't agree more. And, and again, it's, it's a multi-level consistency, right? I mean, mindfulness, the idea that, you know, uh, and, and you can explain that way better than I can, but I, I'm going to give it a shot anyway. <laughs> Uh, uh, so the, the idea of being constantly present, you know, whether it is at the poker table or at the preparation or, you know, being cognizant of what happens, embracing the losses, like that would be another example, you know, like so, some students sometimes ask me, well, Duncan, how, how do you deal with, with losses? How do you deal? Well, in, in, in embracing would be, would be the answer, not not ignoring them. I mean, when we, when we lose, it doesn't mean we feel good. No, no poker player feels good. The difference between a, you know, a good poker player versus a not so good poker player is that the good poker player, even though they're going to feel those negative emotions, they, they will not let it affect their future decisions. That's the only, it's, not, it's not about not feeling bad. It's not about, you know, this is a thing of the past. It's embracing it consistently and going to going going to the next step. So I, I, I truly believe that what you said about mindfulness is spot on because again, consistently mindful. Yeah, I, I love this. It's like, you know, constantly be cognizant of, of, of everything that's happening. Take it, take it in, not pushing it back. If you're angry, you're angry, that's fine. We're humans, we get angry. I get angry too. Everybody, everybody does. But the important thing is to be to be aware of that uh, and you know, hopefully not let it affect our decisions. Yeah, we have to take our losses and we have to reframe them and learn from them, from them without focusing on them. I think that is the big key. And it's all about mind shifting and, and that's, you know, mind shift on demand. You know, we have the ability to shift our mindset on demand in the moment when we have the keys to doing that. It's kind of like what it's kind of like playing the mind shifting card. So I want to end with what advice would you give to women poker players in our population of, uh, in our quest with women's poker association to unite women poker player worldwide? What advice would you give to them? Uh, well, okay, yeah, that, that, that's also that's also a great question. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, number one would be do not do not be afraid to uh, enter the the poker world. I mean, uh, in general, right? I mean, I'm going to give like a a message to all all women out there who, who are listening uh, that you know poker may be you know um, male dominated or whatever by the numbers, but um, a fun fact is that most of my students actually are, 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 are female. So, you know, um, I don't know if it's uh, the, the, the testosterone or the ego of, of men that keep them out of class, but women are actually very smart in trying to learn something because it, before they start risking, risking, risking money, which I think is a very, very good thing. And, and I would say that do not be afraid to... Uh, to compete, to to go at the poker table and to do uh, what what you think what you think is right. Also, um, 
I mean, my, my girlfriend, Asami, she has some of the greatest instincts that, that, that I've seen. And I, I know that there's been some studies that, you know, um, women are better on understanding micro, and, and, and you, you, can, you can correct me uh, about this because it's, it's obviously not, not my domain and I don't want to say incorrect things, but I'm curious about many, many things that I'm trying to read as much as I can. But um, women are really good at understanding um, micro expressions. Uh, men are, we're oblivious to that kind of stuff. <laughs> we're completely, I know, I know by myself, I mean, I'm trying to focus, but you know, uh, and I think that's a great, great thing to have at the poker table. So trust, trust your instincts, um, do what you think is right. Do not, you know, let whatever society standards, it's just numbers anyway. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and move forward. Yeah. So, Plus, uh, games are so much better when, they, when we have female presence at, at, at the poker table. <laughs> you know, I, I, abs I absolutely love it. And I really want to thank you for just jumping in and sharing your wisdom. I mean, I'm going to be re-watching this time and time again to try to figure out what was it he was saying there because I want to refresh my mind and there's so many things that are new to me because I've been involved with family care over the past few years and some of the the new uh, abbreviations are new to me and I really want to thank the women who submitted these excellent questions I mean wow Beautiful questions. they were absolutely fantastic and let me share a couple of screens before we say goodbye and I would like anyone who is on the call to join or on the listening, watching this on the call, watching our, our video, our TV show, let's call it a TV show. Join WPA free, go to WPA.poker and join there for free and please pass it on to your friends, you know, to, to tell anybody that wants to know about poker to, to join WPA. And uh, if you'd like to learn about mind shifting and get a four minute audio from my site, Mind Shift On Demand, just go opt in now and you'll get a four minute audio of my signature mind shift exercise. And people have told me that this mind shift exercise has dramatically improved their poker game and also has been life changing as well. So we're, WPA Women's Poker Association and I want to thank you Duncan for being here today you've been an absolute delight I'd like to ask you what is your takeaway from sharing time with me today what's your takeaway uh, I, 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 I love it I love the, the, the way we're having a uh, there's a lot of things but the first thing that comes to mind is that I love that we're having a conversation instead of some sort of like a dry interview i like that's that's the thing that you are improving you know the these scattered thoughts in my head by by finding parallels analogs and things that you can oh, add to uh, to, to do uh, uh, to these observations and i really like that i mean i i do believe that the best way to move forward in general is to have conversations with, with one another. I mean, see different perspectives uh, and, and try to, to understand one another. So I love that. I love that. It's, and, and I really I, I like the idea of, of mind shifting on demand. And it's, it's, it's really, really, really cool idea. I really love it. Well, cool. And, and I hope to have you back. And, and I'm looking forward to, you know, when you get to an editing phase of the, of the manuscript of your book, send me the manuscript and I'll be happy to give you some input. And I'll be happy to promote yep. your book. When your book comes out, we'll do another one on that. But if you have something that you're, you'd like to get out there, you think, well, you know, I'd like a series of questions on such and such about the poker, just let me know and we'll do another show.